All right, as I mentioned during the announcements, this is a, a kind of a two-part sermon today. And this morning, we're going to be focusing on kind of the first half of 1 Corinthians 15. And it's mostly just dealing with the bodily resurrection of Christ. And this is an extremely important doctrine that, you know, try not to tune out and be like, oh, I already know this. You know, I, I don't need to hear this. This is, first of all, <laughs> The reason why we even celebrate Easter to begin with is just this recognition of the fact that, that Christ died on the cross, but not just died. We don't have a dead Savior. We don't celebrate a, a Savior that's hanging on a cross. We celebrate an empty tomb. We celebrate the fact that He rose again from the dead, that He conquered death and hell. And that's what gives us the hope that we have, that as Christ rose from the dead, we know that we also will have a resurrection. And tonight I'm going to be dealing with the resurrection of the saints. So we see the first type, the first fruits, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to apply that tonight and go through the doctrine and the scripture covering the resurrection of the saints. So try not to miss that if you can. But let's jump into the chapter here in, uh, in verse number one. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible reads, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So he's saying, I'm giving you the gospel here. I've already preached the gospel unto you. The gospel is what saves you. As long as you believe, he says, you, you know, keep this in memory. Of course, um, it's not hard to keep in memory the gospel once you've already trusted your soul in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's, it's kind of hard to forget something like that when, when you've made the choice to put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it, you're not, you're not going to forget something like that. He says, I delivered this unto you, first of all, he said, which I also received. So Apostle Paul is not taking credit as like coming up with the gospel. And this is an important point because there is, uh, you know, there's teachings out there. And one of the teachings known as dispensationalism, where people are teaching, oh, there are different gospels in different time periods. And they'll call this, you know, well, this is Paul's gospel. No, this isn't Paul's gospel. He says, look, I'm just giving you what I've already received. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is the gospel that has existed all throughout time. People have always been saved by grace through faith. You could read Romans chapter 4. You could read many other places. You could read this chapter and, and understand that and see that. Let's keep reading here. He says um, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. There was a prophecy already in the Old Testament of the better covenant of the new covenant that was going to come because the old covenant wasn't sufficient. It was never sufficient. People have never been able to keep the law. It's never been possible. People have never been able to be saved by keeping the commandments and keeping the Ten Commandments and keeping the sacrifices. No one has ever been able to do that. That's why we needed a Savior. If, if there was any reason, if there was any way, if, there was, if it was possible for man to just be righteous, and obey all of God's commandment, then why did Christ even have to come and die in the first place? There would be no point to it because the first covenant would have been just fine. But it was never just fine. It always was there as a, as a picture, as a schoolmaster to lead us unto Christ. People back then, people now, God's law just demonstrates that we're sinners. It shows us our own wickedness. It shows us our need to have a Savior. It did the same thing 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, as it does today. The law shows us that we need a Savior. We're not perfect. And people in the Old Testament, they understood that too. They understood that through their sacrifices. When they sacrificed that Passover lamb every year, they knew that that was representing the Savior to come that there is one sacrifice offered for all, and they're just showing the fact that he's going to come. Just like this last Wednesday, we partook in the Lord's Supper or communion, and the Bible says that Jesus said, hey, as often as you do this, you do show the Lord's death until he come. So in the Old Testament, they were showing the death until he come the first time when they offered up that lamb every year. 
And now when we break bread and drink wine, we're showing his death and what he already did for us now in the past until he come back again. It's, there's one gospel. The Bible calls it the everlasting gospel. And the gospel that Paul is preaching here, he says, hey, this was already according to the scriptures. Scripture already said that a Savior is going to come. According to the scriptures, Christ died for our sins. Verse number four, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. The scripture already said this. It's not Paul. He didn't come up with this gospel on his own. God didn't just give this gospel especially to Paul in order to tell people. He says, this is, I've received this from the scripture. The scripture already prophesied of these things. It is the gospel. There is only one gospel. And the Bible says, you know, if someone come and teach another gospel, let them be accursed. And these people that think that there's going to be another gospel in the future and people are going to be saved by works in the future, hey, let them be accursed. They say, oh, but we're not preaching that right now. You're, but you're preaching that there's another gospel. And Galatians 1 is very clear about anyone that's going to preach any other gospel unto you. There aren't any other gospels. There is one. Every other gospel is a false gospel if it's not the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If it's not grace by faith in Christ, that's it. That's the only gospel that there is. The only difference with the Old Testament is that people didn't know the name of Jesus. But they knew there was a Messiah. They knew there was a Christ. That's what they were trusting, and they're trusting in the Lord. But let's keep going here because I want to I really dig into the resurrection because that's what he's, he's talking about here in verse 4. He says that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to scriptures. That's part of the gospel. So when we go out and preach the gospel to people, yes, we, we, we preach and let people understand that they're sinners, that they need a savior. But it's important and don't gloss over this because there's a lot of things that we emphasize when we talk to people. And one of the things I like to emphasize is the fact that Salvation is eternal. It's eternal life. And since the Bible says that it's everlasting, it's eternal, it lasts forever. So the moment you receive that free gift from the Lord, you have that forever. And if it doesn't last forever, then God's a liar. Because the Bible says in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. That's a promise from God. God doesn't break his promises. He's not a man like you or me. You can't just be like, well, I don't know. Is God going to keep that promise? Of course he's going to keep that promise. He's God. He has to. And he says that it's eternal. He says that that's forever. So yeah, I like to stress that because a lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people have heard different things from the Bible, but they think that, well, I don't know. If I, you know, if I do something really bad, though, I, I, I don't think I'm going to go to heaven. And that's because they're trusting in themselves. They're trusting in their works. They're not trusting in what Jesus Christ had, had already done for them. So it's, it's important to emphasize those things. I'm not saying it's, it's not important. Of course it's important. That's one of those aspects that so many people get confused on. But we cannot be negligent in when we preach the gospel to people that we actually preach the gospel unto them. In your zeal to... to explain other important aspects of salvation don't ever forget what you're preaching is jesus christ yes he bare the sins of the whole world when he was on the cross yes he died and shed his blood to pay for your sins but don't ever skip over the fact that he rose again from the dead that we serve a living savior that he's not just some dead savior he's alive i love those memes that you see sometimes on on social media on facebook or whatever where they go through and they'll show like you know buddha's dead and muhammad's dead you know and, and they're all just men or whatever in these other religions but you know what the tomb of jesus christ is empty the grave of muhammad yeah that's still there wherever that is you know, his, his body, his flesh, his bones, you know, however decayed they are, that's still there in the grave. He didn't come back from the dead. All of those, all of those so-called prophets, they're all dead. Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. Jesus Christ was resurrected. His tomb's empty. And this, and, and, and this is extremely important. We're going to see this emphasized more and more throughout this chapter. This is a very important uh, aspect of, of Christianity that we cannot forget. We cannot let it slide. 
and, and we can't have, you know, believe it or not, this doctrine is under attack. Now, I don't know how far under attack it is in mainstream Christianity, but the fact that Jesus Christ rose bodily in his own body, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that. They believe he was resurrected in a body. They don't like to talk about the difference, but they think that he was in, like God just gave him a different body. Now, obviously, there's a lot of other things they believe that are screwed up. But when people aren't grounded and settled on doctrines, on core doctrines from the Bible, it's easier to be deceived and to be, you know, moved in a direction away from Scripture and away from truth. And everyone ought to have this doctrine just solid and you know from the Bible why you believe what you believe and understand what it says here. Let's keep reading. In verse number five, it says, And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. And notice in verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, verse 8, it's just mentioning all these people. He was seen, he was seen, he was seen. They visibly saw him. They were witnesses to the fact that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. That is what they were witnesses of. And I think it's no surprise that the Jehovah's Witnesses are false witnesses because they want a witness of a different resurrection, of a resurrection that, was, that didn't happen the way that scripture happened. Um, but the fact that he came in, his, that he resurrected his own body is important. Um, turn to John chapter 20. Keep your place in 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to come back here. But turn to John chapter number 20. We're going to see just a few more examples in Scripture, just so you are completely clear that, yes, Jesus Christ, he rose again, and he rose again in his body. His body that was buried is the same body that rose again from the dead. He didn't just resurrect in spirit or in soul. His body came back to life. Body, soul, spirit. Up from the grave. I'm going to read for you in Acts chapter number 1. In Acts chapter 1, verse number 1, the Bible reads, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. So, as the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 is saying, hey, he was seen of Peter, he was seen of the, you know, the brethren, 500 brethren, he was seen of all these people. In the book of Acts, we're being shown here that he was, he showed himself alive by many infallible, he's like, there's no way you can fake this. It's infallible. I mean, he proved that he was alive from the dead beyond any shadow of a doubt. It says, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. You're in John chapter 20. Look at verse number 24. This is the story of, you know, doubting Thomas. If you've heard of doubting Thomas, you don't know what that means. It's, it comes from this story. So after Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, he showed himself unto his disciples. But the first time he showed himself to all of his disciples, Thomas wasn't there. He wasn't present. He wasn't in church that day. And it's important of not missing church, right? You never know what's going to happen. Thomas missed out on something really awesome. Some great understanding, some great knowledge that he just completely missed out on. And it was powerful and you just had to be there at that time. Thankfully, he got another chance to receive that, in, that information and that knowledge. But it was so powerful, he didn't believe it. He couldn't even believe it that, that, you know, everyone's telling him, oh no, Jesus Christ, he rose again from the dead. He's like, I don't believe it. We're going to read that story. Look at verse number 24. But Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe. And again, as long as I brought up Jehovah's Witnesses, here's another proof that they're, they're incorrect when they say that Jesus died on a torture stake. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. They say, well, he didn't die on the cross. And again, 
Anyone who's attacking the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, that is not of God. Amen. That's of the devil. Jesus died on the cross. Amen. And that is very clear from Scripture. He was crucified. Cruc the root word of crucifixion is cr it comes from cross. He died on the cross. They say he died on a torture stake, meaning just a, a pole that went straight up and down. Just because other people were put to death in a similar matter, you know, back in that time, they say, well, that's how Jesus died. And they would say that his hands were, were over his head like this. But here's how, in this one verse that we just read, proves that that's not true. Because Thomas is saying, I'm not going to believe it unless I see in the hands the print of the nails. So it says, I want to see in his hands where the nails are plural went through well if his hands were over his head like this you only need one nail going through both hands because that's the way they say it happened but if they're spread out you need nails plural one going through each hand which it's plural what he's saying here in the scripture he's saying except i see in his hands plural the print of the nails plural there was multiple nails more than one going through his hands one on each hand and he's saying, I want to see that. I want to see those holes in his hands where he was crucified with. I want to put my finger into the print. He's like, I want to put my finger in that and feel it and thrust my hand into his side. He says, except I see these things, I'm not going to believe. There's a pretty tough case here. Verse number 26, and after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. So now Thomas is with them and Jesus shows up and says, then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believing. He's saying, okay, Thomas, you need to see this. He shows up here. Take my hand, Thomas. Can you imagine the way Thomas must have been feeling when Jesus Christ shows up and he's just like, uh, yeah, no, I don't, I, I don't, I don't need to touch it. You know, th <laughs> but this is one of those infallible proofs, right? Thomas is saying, hey, I, I need to see this. I need to touch this. I, Jesus says, okay. He literally rose from the grave in his body and he's like, here you go. You feel that? Here, put your hand right here. Here's your hand, Thomas. Put it in my side where they pierced me. You feel that? It's real. I rose from the dead. He says, be not faithless, but believing. Verse 28, and Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. And again, if you're talking to a Jehovah's Witness, this is a great passage to show them many truths from. Because this also demonstrates that Jesus Christ is God. Now, you might say, yeah, but this is Thomas saying that Jesus is God. This isn't Jesus saying that he's God. Well, look at how Jesus responds to Thomas when John, Thomas says, my Lord and my God, to Jesus Christ because he's just felt the, the holes in his hands. Well, how does Jesus respond? Verse 29, and Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Believed what? My Lord and my God. Because you've seen me, you believed. He didn't say, no, no, Thomas. Thou shalt have no other gods before the Father. He didn't say that. You should have no other gods before Jehovah. He didn't say that. Because Jesus is God. You cannot believe that Jesus Christ is a prophet a prophet of God, a good man, one who speaks truth, if he's not God it, and to still receive worship from someone calling him God and to say, hey, you believe because you've seen me. That would not be of God if Jesus wasn't God. Does that make sense? <laughs> Hopefully it does. But that's... Um, one more just evidence in scripture just demonstrating hey this is how jesus died this is you know he rose again he rose in his own body because he still had the holes in the in the where they where they cut him on his side like that was still there they'll go as far as to say oh well god just put him in another body that was just like that like like god some deceiver 
where you just go, I'm going to put them in this other fake body and I'm going to put these other holes here just so that I can show, t you know, God's not tricking people with some fake body just so that Thomas can believe. This is reality. He's saying, no, you need to believe this. Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Verse 30, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. It's a fact. And it's, they, the Bible is really clear, just expressing, He rose again from the dead. And He did so many ways of showing that He physically arose. It's not, they're not even all recorded. Everything He did, they're not all recorded in this book. He says, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Now, you can apply this, you know, maybe to the whole book of John, but in the context, this is written about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is referring in context, literally right here, that this is written, that these signs are written, that what Jesus came back from the dead and showed unto Thomas the holes in his hand and proving that he resurrected from the dead, said this is written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing you might have life through his name. The power of the resurrection, I mean, he's talking about, I want you to be saved, so you need to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're not saved. You need to believe in a risen Savior, that he literally came back to life in his body. You'd think that this is a pretty common, I mean, this is a common core tenet of Christianity. And you might say, yeah, Pastor Brisbane, I already know this. I've heard this before. I believe this. I heard this my whole life. You would be surprised how many people I run out to when we go out and knock on doors, especially in the younger generation that have never heard this before. You mean what? He came back to life? People haven't heard this before. This should also, you know, light a fire unto you to not just assume that people are going to hear about Jesus Christ and just, just figure that, well, they'll just hear it anyway, one way or another. No, you need to bring it to them. You need to open up your mouth. You need to show this to people. No one person, you can't just say, oh, well, that's pastor's job. Look, there's like six million people in this city. I can't reach everybody by myself. Are you kidding me? Even our church can't reach everybody by ourselves. We need everybody that's a believer going out and preaching to everyone else that's not a believer that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and that there's salvation only through the name of Christ. We all need to be doing that. It is that important. Flip over to Acts chapter 1 for me. I'm going to read from John chapter 2. Just one more place in Scripture in John 2 where, where we can see that Jesus was literally talking about his own body. In John 2 verse 18, the Bible reads, you're going to Acts chapter 1. John 2 verse 18, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? They thought he was talking about the building of the temple, Solomon's temple. It says in verse 21, though, But he spake of the temple of his body. So he says, Destroy this temple. His body, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He prophesied his own resurrection, but he was talking about his body, not a different body, his body being raised up. He came back in the flesh, in his flesh. Acts chapter 1, look at verse number 4, where I want to show you this. And we're going to go through and jump around in the book of Acts, and I want, I want you to see and just pay attention how many times, and I, and I might be beating a dead horse here, but I really want to drive this point home. So just bear with me as we read through these passages. I want you to see how many times the Bible is talking about the, the disciples being made witnesses of the resurrection of Christ. That is specifically talking about Jesus Christ rising from the dead and that they are witnesses, that they are eyewitnesses. They've seen the account so they could relay that to other people and how important it was that they had witnesses in their job as a witness. Look at uh, Acts chapter 1, verse number 4. The Bible says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. 
For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. This is right after the resurrection of Christ. Verse number six. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. He's commanding them that you need to be witnesses unto me, which means... You're going to let everybody else know what you've witnessed of me in Jerusalem, which is where they were residing at in that city of Jerusalem, in Judea, which would be the bigger state area, in Samaria, the neighboring area, and under the uttermost part of the earth. He's saying, I need you to bring this not just where you live, not just in your community, not just in the greater metropolitan area, but under the uttermost parts of the earth. He said, you need to be witnesses to everybody. You need to bring this news everywhere. Publish it far and wide that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. Chapter number 2. Look at verse number 22. Acts chapter 2. The Bible says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Verse 24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. See, now he's quoting the book of Psalms. And he's quoting about the resurrection. Remember, we're talking about the... Um, the proofs and that, you know, according to Scripture, as Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, how that he, he died and he rose again from the dead according to the Scriptures. This is one of those Scriptures that prophesies the resurrection of Jesus Christ, showing that this was already given in the Old Testament. Verse 25, we'll read that again. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now he's going to go further and explain this passage in verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. So he's saying, this is a psalm of David that he's quoting. He's saying, just so you understand, this isn't David speaking about himself. Because David, he's, he's dead, he's buried, his tomb, his sepulcher, it's still here. And it still contains the remains of his body. That's who David is. And then he explains here, verse 30, therefore being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. So he's saying, the reason why, you know, that psalm, it's not because this is about David just, just singing about himself. It's because he's a prophet. And he's actually preaching the word of God. And he's saying, knowing before that God had sworn with this oath, He's talking about the resurrection of Christ. That's what that psalm that we just read is talking about. And it says that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. That's not talking about the, the, the soul or flesh of David. That's the soul and flesh of Jesus Christ. Showing that Jesus Christ... Now, if Jesus Christ's soul was not left in hell, doesn't that mean it had to be in hell? Absolutely. The soul of Jesus Christ went to hell. And this one, even more so than the resurrection of Christ, well, I run into people all the time that have never heard this. I ask, you know, people have heard, well, Jesus Christ, that he, he died on the cross, right? Yeah, he bare the sins of the whole world. A lot of people have heard that. They understand that. Thank God for that. Right. And they heard that, that after three days and three nights, he rose again from the dead. And amen. I'm, I'm, I love that, that a lot of people still have heard that. But there's less people that have heard that then they've heard they died for all their sins. But then there's even less people that understand that. As, well, I ask, well, do you know where Jesus' soul was for those three days and three nights that he was dead? 
You know, he died on the cross. He was empty. You know, where was he? Where, where did he go? Where did his soul go? Most people think he went to heaven because it's Jesus, right? Because he was perfect. But that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says his soul was in hell. And this is a very easy concept to understand. If Jesus Christ came to pay for the sins of the whole world and he bare our sins and he was carrying our sins and he became sin for us, if the punishment for our sins is hell, doesn't it make sense that Jesus actually paid for our sins in hell? Absolutely. 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 And there's nothing to the contrary in Scripture. In fact, it says that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. So while his, his soul was in hell, his body was in a tomb, his body didn't decay. It didn't see corruption. It was preserved. Verse 32, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. He says, we're all witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Turn to chapter 3, verse number 14. The Bible says, But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Talking about the resurrection, saying we are witnesses to the fact that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. Acts chapter 5, verse number 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus. Again, he's talking about the resurrection. Whom ye slew and hanged on a tree, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Acts chapter 10. Again, I, I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to belabor this point, but I just want you to see this. Acts chapter 10, verse number 39. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses, chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. They are making this abundantly clear. We saw this. And in the Bible, you know, the witness of two or three men is, is how you establish truth. There's a lot more than two or three. Right. Jesus is making sure he was seen by many people, by hundreds of people. Now, not by everybody. He didn't show himself to the whole world. But he did show himself to witnesses whose job it was to go out and to preach that they saw Jesus Christ, that he's risen from the dead, and that he is the Christ. Fi the final proof, if everything else that Jesus did in his lifetime wasn't enough to convince you, how about the fact that he rose again from the grave and there is no body of Jesus Christ here on earth? It's gone. It's empty. He's, he's risen. See, Lazarus, whom Jesus rose again from the dead, he resurrected Lazarus, he died again. His body ultimately was still buried on this earth. Everybody who's ever been brought back to life by some miracle, by some miraculous event, all died again one day. They just died. Jesus Christ rose to die no more. Acts 10, we're still there, right? Look at verse number um, 42. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Uh, chapter 13, we're going to read chapter 13. We're almost done, so just bear with me. We're almost done. Acts chapter 13, verse number 29. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are witnesses unto the people. Again, referencing the fact that he was resurrected and that people had seen him and talked with him. They are witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again. God made a promise unto our fathers, unto our ancestors. 
promise of a Christ, promise of a Savior, promise of a resurrected Christ. Hey, God fulfilled that. We are witnesses of that. We saw that. God hath fulfilled the same unto us, our children, that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second Psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, just showing you, this day have I begotten thee, this is not talking about the birth of Christ. This is talking about his resurrection. Because that's what, that's what they're, he's literally saying. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. That's his being begotten of the dead. Verse 34, and as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore, he saith also in another psalm, thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder, and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. There's a lot of people that still don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection is an important event. The resurrection is an event that even the people in charge, you know, Pilate was told, hey, this deceiver said when he was still alive that he was going to rise again after three days. The unsaved folk knew that he prophesied his own resurrection. And just so that there would be no doubt on the resurrection... This happened where he says, okay, we'll make it sure. They've set soldiers, a multitude, a host of soldiers at the tomb just to make sure no one's going to come and, and try to fake the resurrection, right? Come and steal the body of Jesus. They rolled a great stone over it just to make sure that it would be sealed up and that no one would have access to it. And you've got all these soldiers standing guard. Yet the tomb was still empty. No one came and opened it up. The only people that opened up were the angels that came and opened up the tomb, and it was already empty. There was already nobody there. So when, when the people knew about that, because the, the soldiers saw the angels and saw it opened up, and they were afraid. But they were told to lie about it and just say, oh, they fell asleep. Yeah, all the soldiers all were asleep all at the same time, and no one heard the stone roll away from the mouth. No one heard any of that, right? They lied. Now, some people will want to believe that fable, but it's obviously not true. It doesn't even make any sense that that would happen. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, please. We see over and over and over again, and I was showing you all these verses because it's important that they were witnesses of the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection of Christ. The bodily resurrection. We saw him. We handled him. We ate with him. We spake with him. We were with him. We were there. He rose again from the dead. Why is that so important? Why is the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ so important? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to pick up in verse number 12. The Bible says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? He was talking to some people saying, you know, some people didn't even believe in a resurrection of the dead. He's saying, but we're preaching that Christ rose from the dead. How can you even say that there's no resurrection? Verse 13, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? So if there, if there is no resurrection, if people don't, aren't going to resurrect from the grave, he says, then Christ isn't risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. Anyone who believes in a Savior that's not resurrected, that's not alive, it's worthless. It's meaningless to just believe in someone that's just long gone and dead. They can't do anything for you anymore. He's saying, whatever your faith is in that, then it's just meaningless. It's vain. That's not going to help you. Verse 15, Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. So he's saying, 
if there is no resurrection, hey, we're preaching that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So if there's no resurrection, then we're false witnesses. Then we're liars. Then everything that we're telling you is a lie. He says, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. He's arguing with people here that they were claiming according to scripture there was no resurrection. And they're saying, Pff. then we're false witnesses. We're just a bunch of liars that are telling you that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead if, if, if there is no resurrection. Verse 16, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. If you don't believe in a risen Savior, if you don't believe in Christ that rose again from the dead, you are in your sins and you're going to have to pay for your sins in hell because you don't have a Savior that paid for your sins. See, it's the fact that Jesus Christ died, went to hell, but then rose again from the dead, that means payment in full. He didn't die and then go to hell and then just stay in hell permanently forever because then it would never be complete. You can't trust then in, in, a, in a full purchased payment for your sins. It would still be ongoing. He had to come back from the dead to say, done. Transactions, done. It's settled. All of the sins have been paid for. Final. And then you receive that, that gift. Verse 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ... We are of all men most miserable. And we're going to get into more of that later, but basically he's saying, if there's no resurrection from the dead, and now he's starting to refer to our own resurrection, if all we have is this life right here, and that's the only hope we have in Christ is just, well, the, the, the life you live right now, he says, of all the men in the world, we're most miserable. Why would that be? Because as believers in Christ and witnesses of Christ, they were hated. They were beat up. They were thrown into prison. They did not have a very good life on this earth. They suffered persecution and tribulation and anguish and pain and suffering as Jesus did. So he's saying if there's no resurrection from the dead, then it's all worthless. It's all meaningless. And we're of all men most miserable. But the reason why we're not miserable is because there is a resurrection from the dead and that we will be resurrected also and that it is not just in vain that there is an afterlife. There is a heaven. There is something after. There's a kingdom to come. So anything that we suffer, anything that we go through in the short term, in the, in the current, temporarily, is nothing compared to to what God has prepared for us, that what Jesus himself has said, I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. And there's mansions. Was Jesus just one big fat liar? No way. I'm going to close it up with this. I already went over a lot of the scripture in Acts chapter 2 about Jesus Christ's soul going to hell. But seeing how important the resurrection really is, right? Because we've seen you've got to be witnesses and, and so much emphasis placed on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I just want to challenge this one thought. Because people who don't want to accept that Christ's soul went to hell to actually pay for sins... They'll refer to what Jesus said in John chapter 19 when he was on the cross and he said, it is finished. And they'll say, well, when he said it is finished, they say everything he had to do for salvation was finished at the cross. Not true. If everything that was needed for salvation was done at the cross, then why are we reading so much about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, about the fact that he rose again as being a, a critical element of the gospel that the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15 was part of the gospel according to the scriptures. He rose again, not just that he died, not just that he was buried, but that he rose again from the dead. So no, it was not finished when he died on the cross as far as the full package that needed to, to be in place for our salvation which means he must have meant something else because he said it is finished. So something was finished, but it was not the totality of the payment for our sins because he still had to go to hell 
and he still had to rise again from the dead. If Jesus Christ didn't rise again from the dead, our, we would still be in our sins. So that was definitely necessary. So I'm going to read John chapter 19 for you. You can turn if you'd like, but John chapter 19, verse 28, the Bible reads, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Up to this point in his life, see, there is a lot of things that were prophesied about Jesus Christ. And it's amazing when you start comparing all of the events that happened in the New Testament, in the Gospels, with various prophecies of the Old Testament. He was betrayed of his friend. I mean, there's so many, there's so many. I can't, you have to take multiple sermons to go through all of them and just show this is where this was fulfilled. This is where this was fulfilled. His healing of people, raising of the dead, all the miracles that he did, all of these various prophecies, all of that needed to be done because God's word cannot return void. So if a prophecy was made in scripture about Jesus Christ, about the Savior, that had to be fulfilled. So he had a lot of work to do on this earth in order to make sure that every single I was dotted, T was crossed as far as any prophecy regarding him on this life. He had to do all of it. Even to the point of the crucifixion, that specific death, he had to die that death. Not some other death. Not being stabbed, not being, you know, thrown off a cliff. He had to be crucified in order to fulfill the scriptures. So the last prophecy that wasn't fulfilled yet was when he said, I thirst. And they gave him vinegar instead of water. He said, so he's saying, that's it. I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And when he bowed his head, he gave up the ghost. Everything that he had to do on this earth was finished at that point. So now he can die. Now he can give up the ghost. Because there was nothing left to do that he had to do in his body on the earth. But there was still more that had to be done for our salvation. His body had to be put into that tomb. But he's not doing that. Other people put his body in a tomb. His soul went to hell. He still had to be resurrected from the dead. All key elements. It is finished was referring to his what he had to do earthly while he was here. And that's it. It's that simple. And it lines up perfectly with what the scripture is saying. That's why he says, knowing all of these things were now accomplished and knowing that the scripture needs to be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. That's why he said, I thirst. It's so that they would give him vinegar. He didn't say, I thirst, so that they'd give him water. He just needed to fulfill that last prophecy. Oh, they haven't given me vinegar to drink yet. Hey, I'm thirsty. And then he received the vinegar. Why? Because he knew he had to fulfill everything. He cannot leave one aspect undone. He completed it all. The resurrection is important. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is critical. And thank God for a risen Savior. I hope you enjoy your day today. I hope you enjoy time with family and friends and fellowship. And hopefully you've got some time to share the gospel with other people and not forget what this day is all about. The joy, the excitement, the love of, of a Savior that he had for us, that he died for us. But you know what? He conquered death and hell. He rose again from the dead. He is a living, powerful Savior alive to save souls still today. That's who we're trust. That's who I'm trusting in. He's there to save me. He's there to save you. Let's tell other people about him too. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the love that you have for us and for the sacrifice that was made for us. And God, there's so many false religions, false gods, dumb idols out there that, that don't live or breathe, that don't think that can't do anything. But you are the true God, Lord. Help us to know more about you. Help us to be able to teach 
to others more about you, Lord. Help us to, to have the, the strength and the courage to bring up the fact that, that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead to save our souls, Lord. Help us along the way. Help us to reach other people, God. That's our mission here at this church. Lord, help us, please help us to reach more people with the gospel of Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.